to say is that you fell here from another world? But when you wanted to leave and go on to the next world, your path was blocked by some unknown god? Outlanders, your journey ends here. Genshin Impact and Honkai Impact. You've probably heard the two games mentioned together, but have you ever wondered why? Sure, they're both made by the same company, but beyond that, their relationship isn't very clear. Is Genshin a sequel to Honkai? A prequel? A spin-off? Or are the two completely unrelated? Having never played Honkai, I wondered the exact same thing and set out to investigate the connections for myself. After diving headfirst into the story of Honkai Impact 3rd and its related media, I was quite surprised at what I found. Not only can I say with certainty that the two games are connected, but the connections likely go much deeper than initially expected. Now before we start, a quick disclaimer. I will not be covering the specifics of Honkai's plot from any media type outside of one singular event from the Heritage comic. I will also not be talking about any specific characters from the Honkai universe, as I've found that the character journeys within the Honkai universe are inconsequential to the point of this particular video. In that respect, this video will be spoiler free, but when it comes to the Genshin side of things, you'll want to have played and completed the main storyline up until the end of version 1.3. It should also be mentioned that the connections I will be covering in this video are not comprehensive or complete. MiHoYo has a tendency to reuse plot devices, names, aesthetics, and themes, but for the purposes of this video I will only be focusing on the world building, and will not be focusing on characters, place names, weapon names, etc. We'll save that for another video. So with that out of the way, let's start things off with a quick overview of Honkai Impact. Honkai Impact takes place in an alternate version of Earth, with civilization constantly fighting for survival against otherworldly beings hell-bent on its destruction. These beings are known as the Honkai, and have no bodies of their own. They can only manifest completely from within a human host. These corrupted humans are known as Hershers, and are responsible for triggering apocalyptic events in their attempt to destroy humanity whenever its technology advances too far. These events are known as impacts. Multiple organizations were formed in an effort to quell the Hersher threat, each with varying motives and even more varied methods. The organizations aren't important to the purpose of this video, but I mention them because several of their accomplishments are. Of the two relevant accomplishments, the first are known as Valkyries. These are female warriors artificially altered to be able to fight on par with the Honkai beasts, and sometimes Hershers. They're Honkai Impact's equivalent to Genshin Impact's Vision Holders, or Allogenes, which is why I'm mentioning them now. The second is far more interesting, and is possibly the entire reason that Genshin Impact exists. You see, assuming Valkyries might not be enough to combat the Hersher threat, the aforementioned organizations of Honkai Impact decided that if they couldn't beat the Hershers, perhaps their best hope of survival was to create a backup copy of humanity. That way, if the Hershers did manage to obliterate civilization completely, humankind could be restored from a backup. Automatically, of course. They called this program the Project Save, and split it into four plans. Project Stigma, Project Arc, Project Veluca, and Project Ember. Of these, Ark, Veluca, and Ember are relevant and are all considered failed projects. Project Stigma, on the other hand, is an ongoing plot point within Honkai Impact and as far as I can tell has no bearing on anything in the world of Genshin. For now. So let's start with Project Ark because that's where things get interesting. The goal of Project Ark was to build an enormous spacecraft carrying a copy of the Human Genome Library and launch it into space in order to seek out another habitable planet, perhaps an effort to outrun the Honkai threat. This project can be considered a partial success or a partial failure since the spaceship was successfully constructed and launched, but has since gone missing in the depths of space. 
So what happened to it? Well, Genshin Impact happened. Okay, that felt random, I get it, but bear with me for a minute as I go off on a rather long and convoluted tangent. But it's relevant, I promise. Thus far, the entire premise of Genshin Impact centers around the theory of Gnosticism, which is a branch of early Christianity and Judaism. Gnostics believed that the personal spiritual knowledge, also known as Gnosis, was greater than the authority of the traditional church. Unlike the Christian Bible, which focuses on the concepts of sin and repentance, Gnostic texts focus instead on illusions and enlightenment. I don't think I need to remind you that Gnosis and Genshin Impact represent the unique power of an Archon, which is, by the by, also a Gnostic term. But I will point out that illusions and enlightenment have a lot in common with delusions and visions, which are the primary sources of godlike power within the game. So Mihoyo is obviously going hard on this theme of Gnosticism, and believe it or not, that actually matters here. Because you see, the world of Tivat is actually very likely Project Ark. Don't believe me? Well, what if I told you that Tivat is actually the Hebrew word for boat or ship, but is far more often used to describe a very specific kind of boat, an ark. In fact, Noah's Ark is called Tevat Noah, or the Ark of Noah, in Hebrew. Pardon my pronunciation. Now given the plethora of Gnostic ties in the game thus far, this cannot be a coincidence. Mihoyo doesn't do coincidences. I mean, look at how these twins are depicted as traveling across the sky as twin stars, and then compare it to how Project Ark looks in this page from the Heritage comic. That has to be deliberate. So let's talk about Project Ember. Project Ember stands for Emergency Mass Backup Evacuation and Revival Plan. Pioneers from this program were to pass on knowledge and technology to whatever surviving humans they could find after an impact in order to rebuild civilization. This project backfired and brought forth even stronger Hershers, but the mass backup part stood out to me. While it was never clearly stated where this backup was kept, it was entirely possible that a copy of it made it to Project Ark in some form. After all, the purpose of the Ember Pioneers sounds an awful lot like the role of the Archons within Genshin. They are to guide humanity by passing on knowledge and technology. In the case of Archons, these might be visions. Now remember what I said earlier about Gnostics calling personal spiritual knowledge their Gnosis? Well, personal knowledge sounds a lot like what Ember was supposed to pass on, and each Archon carries a single Gnosis. Fun fact, each Gnosis is also shaped like a chess piece. Morax has a rook, while Barbados has a queen. Coincidence? Not a chance. Mihoyo does not do coincidences, but we'll talk more on Gnosticism and Genshin in another video. So that brings us to the last project, Voluka. Now while there's nothing hidden in the name, there is a lot to unpack here. Project Veluka's goal was the observation and pursuit of solutions to the Honkai threat through the virtual analysis of other worlds. In other words, by observing parallel universes, a world in which the Honkai have been successfully destroyed may be discovered. If such a world did exist, then perhaps it could be studied in order to discover a way to quell the Hershers within the original world of Honkai Impact. Of course, if we're talking about peering into the observable realities of other universes, we're basically diving into quantum physics, anime edition. So Project Veluca led to the discovery of the Sea of Quanta. And if your brain just autocorrected that into quantum, well, it's nice to know I'm not alone. Anyway, the Sea of Quanta is a fancy name for the space between realities, a place where time, space, physics, and logic don't have any real rules because it twists itself to reflect the mind of the one observing it. It's malleable. Alongside the Sea of Quanta is another symbolic discovery called the Imaginary Tree. This is mostly just a representation of observable reality as it branches outwards indefinitely into endless possibilities, with each branch ending with a new leaf, also known as a universe. By making use of this imaginary tree as a form of scaffolding, or some kind of weird map, an infinite number of worlds can be observed. 
And that's exactly what happens. Two characters in Honkai Impact are known to have observed other worlds through this method, one of them even catching a glimpse of Dvalin flying over old Mondstadt on a computer screen. And yes, that is really Dvalin and not some weird look-alike. Mihoyo did confirm this in a dev interview. Anyway, TLDR. The Sea of Quanta is an Alice in Wonderland-esque space of chaos, and the imaginary tree is the pathway you travel through it to reach different worlds. On a conceptual level, you can think of the sea as chaos and the tree as the order within it. Now, Project Veluca was considered a failure because there were no worlds in which the Hershers had been defeated, but that doesn't mean that there was no value. The characters solely responsible for the task of observation and analysis eventually fell to the bottom of the Sea of Quanta and, theoretically, died. Only he ended up in an even stranger liminal space with a disembodied voice promising him the answers to the universe itself, but only after playing a game of chess. Well, Chinese chess. Go, to be precise. But thematically, playing any kind of chess with a being akin to a god reeks so much of the Archons and their chest-shaped gnosis that I can't help but smell a connection. So humor me for a minute as I don my little tinfoil hat and do a little speculation. And uh, before we do, this is kind of the end of what you need to know about Honkai and Genshin. That's factual and not speculation or theorizing, so if that's all you wanted to know, you can probably cut the video short. But if you're interested in some theories and some other really wild connections, let's continue. So let's assume for argument's sake that Genshin's Tavat really is Project Ark. Is it not possible that the spaceship found a rift in space-time and traveled through it, only to wind up in an endless abyss? Because Honkai Impact has made it quite clear that people can survive in the Sea of Quanta. And Genshin has clearly stated that there are multiple beings that live within the Abyss. At least a whole army's worth of beings, if the thousands of Abyss mages I've fought there are any indication, but I digress. We also know from Tartalia's story that time flows differently in the Abyss than it does in Tevat. When he fell into the Abyss, he was there for what he thought was three months, but when he returned to Tavat, only three days had actually passed. This sounds like some quantum time loopy quackery that's not unlike how the Sea of Quanta seems to behave. And then there's this place from the beginning of the game and the loading screen. Where the heck is this place? It can't be Celestia. I know Celestia keeps getting bigger and bigger with every update as it spirals towards Tavat like something straight out of Majora's Mask, but it is not this big and endless, and is hovering above Tavat, not between worlds. And besides, we can see enough of Celestia right now to know that it doesn't quite look like this. So the twins have apparently been traveling through a place that seemingly has no end. And who would build that kind of place? No one. That's who. It's a nonsensical space that's basically shaping itself to match the observer that's observing it, which sounds a lot like the Sea of Quanta. So is this place also the abyss? A space between worlds? Or is this place actually the pathway, also known as the imaginary tree, and these doors we keep going in and out of every day to log into the game, are they just leaves? I mean, without an observer, the Sea of Quanta or even the imaginary tree itself would be nothing more than a mass of chaos where logic has no meaning and anything is possible. Which kind of sounds like domains. Yes, the, the ones in game that we go through every day to spend resin. I mean, they're just giant stone doors that go to literally nowhere. You can see the rocks behind them, followed by weird cosmic smoke, so we must be going through some sort of cross-dimensional portal winding up inside of a weird ritualistic room surrounded by an endless void of lightning storms and floating debris and just an endless sea of destruction and... <sighs> So the loading screen is kind of a nice, happy place, whereas the domains are the stuff of nightmares. The Sea of Quanta has that exact same dichotomy. It's at that point where it's hard for me to believe that the Sea of Quanta and the Abyss aren't related. Assuming, of course, that domains lead to a space within the Abyss. 
oh, this could mean that Teyvat is a computer simulation, because let's be real, how could a world that size fit inside of a ship? But what's more likely is the idea that while floating through the deep recesses of space, the Ark was sucked into a rift that landed it smack dab in the Sea of Quanta, where the backup of humanity began to build its own universe. Or perhaps it's leveraged the powers of the Sea of Quanta, you know, in the way that anime quantum mechanics can, to make itself bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, Doctor Who TARDIS style. And it's re recreating the universe with the help of its gods or archons, which include the sustainer of heavenly principles, of course, who may in fact just be a system administrator dishing out judgment upon the users that violated the terms of service by seeking out forbidden knowledge about the ARC source code via alchemy, specifically Chemia, and thereby rejecting their predetermined destinies as dictated by each person's constellations that the gods and thereby archons have the duty to uphold so humanity can't progress past the point of being able to leave Teyvat because there's nothing outside of it because it's actually all the abyss slash sea of Quanta. <sighs> yeah, okay, that's a little bit of a stretch. But it would help explain why Scaramouche called the stars in the sky a hoax, but that's also a topic for another video and just heavy speculation. So to summarize, Genshin Impact is likely a spin-off from Honkai Impact, and it takes place at the same time as the events from Honkai Impact 3rd, which is the video game, but in a galaxy far, far away seeing as it's likely that Teyvat is the result of Project Ark and thus contains a backup copy of everything that happened within the Honkai universe, we have and will continue to see lots of very similar characters, themes, and maybe even world history replaying itself from within Genshin Impact's story. Now even when the similarities are not directly lifted from Honkai, they are nice callbacks, and I really think they enhance the player's enjoyment of Genshin, at least when they're noticed. Kind of like how the wing designs of the twins match the logo design of the Fire Moth organization from Honkai. That's the same organization that was responsible for Project Save, and as you remember, one of Project Save's little sub-projects was Project Arc, which is probably Teyvat, and I'm not going to start this all over again. <clears throat> but what do you think? Was there anything I didn't cover, or is there something you'd like to hear more about? Let me know down in the comments below. Thanks a ton for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.